Yeah, but this is the key. Bienvenido. Hello, good morning. Um, well, welcome everybody. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry I cannot do this in Spanish. Um, I'm, I speak a bit of Spanish, I understand Spanish, but uh, I'm not comfortable enough to do a, a presentation in, in Spanish, so I, I apologize for this. Um, so this is, the, this is what I'm going to be talking to you about uh, in the next uh, 25, 30 minutes. Um, so is data literacy the, the new data science? So, um, so I'm the director and co-founder of an organization that is called Data Pop Alliance. Uh, data Pop Alliance is a joint initiative of uh, the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, the MIT Media Lab, and the Overseas Development Institute in the, in the UK. And we work on uh, big data and development, um, so focusing very much on and in uh, developing countries uh, around the world. And we have uh, several programs uh, in, uh, in, in Colombia. So where, okay, so this is, um, so this is a sort of like a, a short timeline of, of the history of, uh, of, of big data, if you will, and, and data the rise of data as a, as a concept. So today, uh, in 2015, at the end of 2015, everybody talks about data, everybody talks about big data. It has been described as the new oil, et cetera, et cetera. But essentially what this, this timeline says, what this slide says, is that this phenomenon is, is actually very recent. Uh, I came here for the first time in Colombia two years ago, exactly two years ago, uh, to talk at a, for the, uh, about big data and official statistics at the 16th anniversary uh, of DANE. And, and back then, uh, it was something very new, like the, the, sort of the application and implications of big data for, for, for research, for policy making, and for society. And in the past two years, a lot, a lot has changed. So the pace of change is, is, is very, very fast. So I'm not going to go through all these, all these slides. And so these are, in a sense, like some of the seminal papers and, and articles that have been published, written over the past um, six, seven years. So not just two years. Um, so I, I, I started working in this field in 2010 when I worked for UN Global Pulse uh, in the executive office of the Secret Ge Secretary General. Um, and so I, I, I wrote this paper here, um, the Big Data for Development Challenges and Opportunities. And this was really like, so like my foray, my entry in, uh, in, this, in this field. And here, so the, 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 the line is just the returns uh, for the term big data in, in Google. So if, if you go to Google Trend and you type big data, you will see the sort of the, the interest over time for big data. So this is just a, a proxy, if you will, for the interest um, in, in, um, in big data. And so around 2008, 2009, um, it was clear that something was happening, that with all the sort of the, 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 the analog to digital transition that we were experiencing, uh, we had like all these new data sets and, and new kinds of data. So these, these data breadcrumbs, these little data pieces that people, that all of us leave behind when we move around with our cell phones, when we use a credit card, when we use easy pass. If you take the Transmilenio, you, have a, you swap your card. These are all like tiny, tiny data. And this is the bulk of, of big data. So around 2008, 2009, so some leading researchers have, have realized and said, this is going to change uh, social science and research and probably policy and society very dramatically. So here are some examples uh, of, of, of papers who have been written. The last two were written more recently. Um, and the last one, uh, so big data, new tricks for econometrics, actually gets to this issue of, of data science, uh, which is one of the two concepts that, that, that I'm talking about uh, this morning. And es essentially what it says is that to make for, for, econ for economists um, and, and social scientists, but also for policymakers and perhaps for citizens, um, we need like new, new tools um, to, to make sense of, of these data and to make sense of, of the world. So Hal Varian is often quoted as having said that the sexist job uh, in, in the next 10 years is going to be a data scientist. You've all heard that 10 times. Actually, he, he didn't say that. He said that the next, the, the, the sexist job is going to be statistician. 
Um, and it's indeed, it's not what happened, because the sexist job is indeed to be a data scientist. Um, and it's actually pretty interesting to think of how this concept of data science has managed to like, position itself so, so centrally as being indeed the sexist job um, in, in, the, in, in, the, in this decade. So just spending some time on, on data science, so this is also a very famous uh, diagram that Drew Conway um, so, well, drew in 2010. Uh, so the data science the Venn diagram. So this diagram is just trying to, to say, well, so what is data science? So data science is just the intersection of these three components or three sets of skills. Um, so traditional research would fall at the intersection of math and stats and substantive expertise, where substantive expertise can be, um, well, you have, you have some background in epidemiology or you have some background in, in philosophy or you have some background uh, in, in, in demography or in any other social science or any other field, even, even history, like the humanities. Um, so this is, a, yeah, this is a pretty basic um, and well-known um, diagram, but uh, I think it's, it's, in, it's, it's interesting to reflect on its, on its, on its different, different pieces. And here you see concepts like machine learning, um, and of course the, the danger zone, which is when you have substantive expertise, hacking skills, so like coding skills for, for, the, for the most part, um, but no knowledge of statistics, for instance. So you, you, may, you may think that a correlation is a, is a causation, for instance, and you, make, you can make very, like, very bad inferences and decisions. Now, um, if, if, you, if you think of these three components, okay, the three pillars that we talked about, and how they sort of intersect with the, the, the traditional cycle of, of research or even policy making. So the traditional, the, the, the scientific method on which a lot of our modern societies have been based is you sort of ask a question first, there's a problem, you have a question, you sort of design your research, you, you, you collect your data, you analyze, you make inferences, etc., and then you present. So, of course, with big data, it's, uh, this, this cycle is, is, is challenged. A lot of people, so you saw in the first, in the first slide, we're asking whether big data is, in a sense, the, the end of theory, yeah, you, that you don't need questions, that you have so much or so many data that the answers are, are there and you just need to crunch, to crunch the data. So here, what is, so there, I think there are, there are three, um, so what, what is interesting is, is, um, is that you see the, the, the importance of substantive expertise in this, in this graph. So we must really uh, keep in mind the fact that, uh, that, that, that substantive thematic topical experts are very, very needed in, in the age of, of big data. Um, if, you do, if you work on, 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 on criminality, for instance, you need to work with people uh, who are experts um, in, in, in public safety, um, like human dynamic, etc. Not just uh, data scientists without uh, um, technical, sorry, without thematic expertise. So this is a, 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 a slide that shows um, the, the sort of so five examples of data science courses. So there are a lot of data science courses that have been developed uh, around the world, um, but there are actually very few in, in developing countries. So you see the, their names here at the top, and you can see that most of them are based in, in the cloud, and uh, so online courses, and one of them is based um, in, the, in the United States, so at, at, at UC Berkeley. Um, and so this is a paper that, uh, that, that evaluated, that assessed these five programs along the cycle of the, your traditional research uh, path. And so red means uh, not there. So red means missing. So what you can see is that a lot of these programs are actually missing some very critical components of the sort of traditional uh, research cycle. Uh, s for instance, question conceptualization, research design, data selection. So data selection is the, is the question of which data do I need? Which data do I need to look into? Um, and essentially, so the programs that don't have that take the data for granted. The data is there. Uh, they don't really um, train so the students to question the data collection process, to question um, the, the very nature of the data that they have at hand. Um, and they say, well, you know, crunch them. Go through the, go through the, um, the data sets and, and, and basically crunch the, the data. So, and this is a... Um, a famous quote so, by François Rabelais, so, uh, uh, a, 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 French, um, a French writer and philosopher. 
uh, which is, of course, very well known. Science without conscience is the soul's perdition. Uh, so, of course, it's tempting to say data science without conscience is, uh, is the soul's perdition, um, which is another way of saying just it's, it can be very, very dangerous. Data science without conscience can be can be very dangerous. Um, and here another quote um, by another uh, <laughs> French scholar, uh, Bruno Latour: "Change the instruments, and you will change the entire social theory that goes with them." So, of course, one of the biggest, uh, most complex, but also most interesting questions with the rise of big data and data is is whether and how it is going to change fundamentally societies, change power structures, um, change decision-making processes, not just create new insights um, while keeping the rest intact. And I think it's clear that it's going to be the, the, the former. It is going to change societies very, very, very fundamentally uh, in ways that are, that are very uncertain. It can be for the best or it can be for the worst. So this is um, so this is a, a, a cartoon that I did um, for so one of my um, papers a couple of years ago, a couple of months ago, well, a year or so ago, that tries to capture this, these two elements. So, well, hopefully the <laughs> the cartoon is like self-explanatory. Otherwise, it, like it, the, the cartoons are, are missing the point if you have to explain them. But just to you know make the points. This cartoon says two things. First, it says um, that um, there are like ethical, very, very complex ethical considerations coming with, with big data and, 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 uh, and, and data science. Uh, surveillance is one, of course. Targeting is one, of course. You can be targeted with, with ads or you can be targeted with drones. Um, and the second thing that this, this, that this cartoon says is um, that these, so these little people under the microscope, so us, if you will, are, are very disempowered. They don't really, they're not, they're not part of the, of, 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 of the system, except to be subjects of the, of the analysis. Um, but they don't, they don't participate. So they're, they're bo there is both the ethical and, and the political dimension. Here, this is one example of where these questions of ethics and power came very strongly to the forefront of the of the debates. So, as you may recall, and, and I'm going to move here. So, as you may recall, um, so uh, so the there was an, an Ebola outbreak in um, in West Africa, um, so last year, and a lot of people in the in the development UN research community were saying, "Oh, we need the cell phone data. So, we need the the, the, the call detail records uh, from the operators in these countries to be able to monitor population movement." Uh, and, and in a sense, do, do good. Most of them, or all of them, were, were well-intentioned. But here, the, very quickly, the problem is that the people represented in these data sets uh, in Sierra Leone and, and Liberia and Guinea did not really provide their consent to have their data analyzed. They may have signed something when they got their, their phone, uh, but that's not a really informed consent. We all check boxes. Of, of guidelines and principles, etc., without reading them. So it's 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 not really informed consent, and that's a very hard question in the age of data. What what is informed consent? The other thing is we're talking about Sierra Leone, uh, Liberia, so countries that ha that went through decades of civil wars. So the risk is these are very sensitive environments. So it, the, the the potential benefits of using these data must be and was um, like balanced against the risks that this could pose to populations. For instance, if there was a curfew in one area of the country that was decided by the government, well, maybe the data could actually reveal that some ethnic group in the country did not respect the curfew. And that can have, obviously, a lot of very, very bad consequences. So this is just to, to stress the sort of a, the complexity um, um, and, and the sort of ethical and political dimensions uh, of big data beyond the, the, the so like technological and technical um, aspects. Now let's move on to, to, to data literacy and, and try to see how these two like, connect. So data literacy is a sort of like a new buzzword, if you will. So it's, you may not have heard about it. It's actually pretty hard to translate in most languages. It doesn't translate well in Spanish. It doesn't translate well in, in, in French. Um, I don't know about German because I, I forgot my, my, my German, but uh, it, it doesn't translate very well in, 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 in many languages. But it was actually mentioned um, 
it was actually mentioned for the first time in, 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 in this uh, major report in 2014, so last year. Um, so when the, uh, this, this uh, a group appointed by the UN Secretary General released this report about the data revolution, which was called A World That Counts. And here in this paper, so there is this quote that you will see, it, it basically called for enhancing, funding, promoting, supporting data literacy. And you have a sense, like, like a bit of a definition, and here at the bottom you, you can see at the end of the sentence that it also talks a bit later in the document about data and statistical literacy. So here the point is, is that it's not very clear yet what is data literacy. Um, is, it, is it data and statistical literacy? Is it numeracy? Uh, is, it, is, it, is it something different? Um, so, and another question is how is it, how is it different from, from data science when we think and talk about data literacy? Um, does that include data science? Is it, is it, is it, is it narrower? Is it a, a sort of like the first step towards data science? Um, and if we think in like in a historical perspective, what will a, a data literate society, so in, in 2030, uh, like in 15 years, you know, think of, of kids who were born, like who were born this year or, or young kids, what will the world they live in be in 2030 and what will constitute a, a data literate society? So there is also always this question of, yeah, should kids learn how to code? Uh, well, the answer is yes, but like it's not sufficient. And then, so these are my daughters, uh, and, and the question is like, speaking of data literacy, I mean, should a parent, I mean, especially a parent that is, that is relatively data literate, be putting up photos of their kids on, on, on this slide? Should we share photos of our kids on Facebook? The answer is probably no, uh, and yet, most of us do it uh, because perhaps we don't really understand the risks that are associated with, with doing this. So data literacy has received a lot of press. Um, so here is like two, here are two, two, two articles um, that, talk, that talk recently about data literacy. And so we can take a quick look at uh, some of their uh, ex extracts. And so the first one says essentially data literacy is the ability or ease to do so where to do so is to analyze 18 billion data points. So the ability and, and, and ease to analyze 18 billion points. And the author says this is what is called data literacy. Well, that's his definition, um, and we don't have to agree with the fact that this is what data literacy is, but that's one definition. Here is another one that becomes interesting because it, it talks about democratization, it talks about democracy, so it talks about power, it talks about political processes, etc., etc. And what is actually pretty, pretty, uh, pretty interesting, <laughs> or, uh, or even a bit funny, is that this definition here is about data democ democratization. So the, the definition of data democratization, according to the author, is a data platform that works equally well for the marketing, sales, and editorial teams. So this is just to say that, I mean, this is a very narrow and shallow conceptualization of, of data literacy or data democratization, something that works for all sections, all departments of a, of a company. And when we talk or think about literacy, of course, it's more, I mean, it's much deeper, broader um, than, than, than that. So for the most part, data literacy has been, to date, understood, conceptualized as a sort of like a, a, a transformative skill. The, this could be, if you start, all of you here, if you start thinking about you know, what could be my definition of data literacy, this is probably the kind of definition that you would come up, and it, it is the kind of definition that I came up with the first time that I started thinking about data literacy. So it's something like the ability to understand, find, collect, interpret, visualize, and support arguments using quantitative and qualitative data. So I will say that I, that I don't think it's that. So it, I'm just putting it here because just to say this is, for the most, like this is how data literacy is usually conceptualized and defined. Okay, this is not my definition of data literacy, and I don't, uh, and I don't think that this is uh, a good definition of data literacy. And I will come back to that in a few minutes. So, this uh, this slide is also a very famous slide of the of the Economist from 2010. It just shows data literacy in a, in a sense as yeah, the ability to transform raw data into into something useful. But the problem is that it doesn't really question the data collection process. It doesn't really question whether, whether the data 
um, has been collected ethically or whether there are risks associated with the data, data collection process. And it doesn't really question the use of the data. It doesn't really question what, what the data is used. So here it is to, uh, so to grow a plant, but there are, there are data can be used in many, many nefarious ways. Um, and here it only focuses on, 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 on the, sort of the data literacy um, as, as technical skills to transform a raw material into, into something else. Now, the issue is that if you stick to this definition, um, well, so an NSA analyst um, so, or any, anyone involved in mass surveillance uh, of citizens is actually highly data literate. This is the exact same definition that I put up. An, an NSA analyst would be extremely data literate. So the question is, is this what we want, in a sense? Is, this, like, is the society of 2030 that I alluded to, do we want a society where data scientists, um, it, do we want a society of data scientists where data scientists, or is, is a data literate society a society of data scientists? And is a data literate society a society where uh, people have very strong technical skills? Uh, but do not really question the larger like power dynamics um, around them. So I think it's always useful to so like go back to history. Um, so this is the printing press, and um, so now I'm going to take a quick look at at, at lit literacy in in history in just two slides. So actually, as I, as the, the title said, so literacy and development. Um, so it, it's it's a are, are in, uh, have a very, very complex, um, very complex affair, a very, very complex relationship. It seems like as people get more literate, a lot of good things happen. Um, and of course, like on balance, it, it, it's true, um, but it's not linear, uh, it's not easy, it's not a smooth process. So during the Industrial Revolution, uh, the, so the vast majority of workers did not need to be data literate. In, so in, in, in Europe in the 19th century. So some of them had to be data literate to perform, to perform some tasks. Um, and, the, and by the end of the 19th century, most of the, most of the, of the European population was, data li was, sorry, was literate, but the measure of literacy, what made them being literate, was the ability to sign their name. So of course, I mean, it's, it's a very, very like, low standard for, for literacy, and today the standards would be much higher. So, which is to say that literacy is an evolving concept. It, of course, it has to, it, it, you are literate in a given context. You're not literate in, in, in the abstract. Um, and, the, and, the, and the first, um, the first uh, uh, quote, I mean, the, yeah, the, the first part, gets to the point that um, that, that, for the, that very often people are not being trained into something uh, for their own good. I mean, there are very, di di very different incentives at play, and we have to recognize the sort of incentive structures um, around, around us. So this, uh, this is, um, um, I, I, will, I will spend two minutes now on, um, on this book by Claude Lévi-Strauss. So Claude Lévi-Strauss Lévi was uh, a friend, French anthropologist uh, and ethnologist, and I'm sorry that my, <laughs> my references are, are French scholars, but uh, um, so he was one of the, one of the, the, the most famous uh, like anthropologists uh, of, the, of the 20th century. Uh, and tomorrow is actually the, the, the anniversary of his, uh, of his passing in 2009. So in 1955, he wrote this book, Triste Tropique. And he spent some time working in Brazil, so you can see Bogota here. And he studied the role of writing, uh, since we're talking about literacy. So he studied the role of writing in history. And so he has these two, which I, I found like, like really thought-provoking um, quotes. So you may or may not agree with them, uh, but I think they're really worth reading, uh, hearing, and, and thinking about. So the gist of his argument is, well, he starts by saying, writing is a strange thing. It would seem as if appearance could not have failed to wreak profound changes in the living co conditions of our race. So, and, and, and positive conditions. And then, looking back at China uh, and Egypt, 
So across history, he says that consistently, again in 1955, consistently, or this is his, his argument or assumption, the primary function of writing as a means of communication is to facilitate the enslavement of human beings. So it's not to enlighten people, it is to enslave people. So why is that? It sounds like fairly counterintuitive. Well, because once you have a sort of literate society, you can create nation states, you can create armies, uh, you can create uh, factories. And it's pretty much what happened in the 19th century in France, when nation states were being built in France, in Germany, uh, in Italy. Um, they were massive e literacy campaigns so to, to, to teach kids in school um, how to speak the language. And, and he says, so I will just uh, focus on the, on the last part, he says in, in, in these times and in this, in this context, so in, 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 in Europe at the end of the 19th century, the fight against illiteracy goes on par with an increase in the control of the power over citizens. So it is a, it is a lit literacy programs, by his argumentation, were used to actually entrench, reinforce existing power structures rather than challenge them. So now if we take a step back and we think, or a step forward, and we think of where are we today? If we take a, like a sort of like hard, cold look at the state of affairs, is data empowering people or is data disempowering people? Of course, it's not a black and white uh, question. It's not a black and white answer. It's neither no or yes. But like clearly today, if we uh, skip this one, if we think of um, who benefits most from, 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 from big data, on balance, it's mostly governments who have the capacity and, and corporations who have the capacity. Um, and of course, there is like a nascent so like big data ecosystem in, in civil society, um, but it's still, it's still pretty slim. And I think this is really so like the, the way forward, trying to empower people um, with, with, with their data. So, um, and things, as I said at the beginning, are changing very fast. Everything is changing very fast in the, in the realm of, um, of big data. And uh, after the sort of hype of the first few years, uh, where, where data was going to like, change the world magically, um, so there has been a bit of a, of a backlash or like a greater recognition of the, of the risks and, and requirements of how um, so, so societies could leverage uh, data for, for the greater good. So these are some examples of, of the kinds of, of reflections um, and decisions that, that have been made over the past uh, two years um, to, to try and uh, mitigate the risks of uh, that, 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 that some of the risks that come that come with uh, with, with big data. So for instance, the, the very question of data collection: How much data should we collect uh, about ourselves? For how long should our um, like our tweets live on forever? Um, should our credit card transactions live on forever? Who, has, who should have control over them? So these are the sort of, the sort of like really hard um, and very interesting questions that, that are coming up. This uh, photo here is also um, a, a way of, of pointing to the, the, the need for, um, in, in, in any, in any like big data projects for, for, for people uh, to also to be, more, to be more involved, for instance, in the, in the, in the collection process, the design process. And so I mentioned people. So I think that people need to get um, to get greater control uh, over over their data. Uh, I think that's a really key requirement for the for, for the future. And I think this is what is going to happen. Uh, whether it's going to be is going to be smooth or whether it's going to be more cha chaotic um, is, is remains to be seen. But I think this is this is what is going to happen. So it means that when we talk about the development data revolution, um, and I like this quote um, by Jonathan Glemmy. The data revolution needs to go beyond the geeks. So the geeks would be like the you know, standard, uh, tradition, like hackers. So someone in, in the Venn diagram who wouldn't necessarily have uh, thematic expertise, but who's just, just very good at crunching data. And also the bean counters. So the bean counters refer to like, let's say like official statisticians. Um, and, and, and so the, the, the argument is um, that, like, that civil society and, and, and citizens and communities should also be very involved in, in designing the future of a, of a, of a big data. And so I'm almost done. Um, 
actually, so what is it, to, to come back to the question of literacy, so what I think is actually very, very interesting um, and reassuring is that, in a sense, I'm not sure we need to think about or to, to, to come up with a new term of data literacy. I think the, the, the definition of literacy that we have now is sufficiently encompassing and sufficiently broad and complex and agile to be used and to be relevant in the age of data, so to be relevant in today's age. So to make the point clearer, it's not really about how can we promote data literacy, it's how can we promote literacy in the age of data. When you start thinking about data literacy, you think in very technical terms. You think, oh, people are gonna, be, are, are gonna have to use to be, be, to be taught to code. People are gonna have to, be, um, uh, to know how to use Python, etc., etc. These are all very valuable skills, don't get me wrong. But they are not at odds with this conceptualization of literacy. So the UNESCO in 2006 came up with this definition about, data, about literacy. What is literacy? Well, literacy is about enabling individuals to achieve their goals, to develop their knowledge and potential, and to participate fully in their community and wider society. So this is literacy. Um, and in the age of data, it will most likely need be have good technical skills when it comes to data analytics, to data science, for instance. But, it, but it's broader than that. Um, okay, so this is the last slide. So to sum up, if you think about, so the, the, the starting point was, uh, so was, was data science and, and, and data literacy. So I spent some time thinking or talking about data science and sort of like different, different pieces, etc., and I sort of highlighted the, the recognition of the complexity, the, the growing recognition of the complexity um, of, of, of data science and its ethical and, and political implications. Um, so and then I try to I move to data literacy, and I want to end on, on, on this notion of data literacy. So I think that um, so da data literacy, there's going to be a lot of questions about what it is. I think it should be defined with keeping its purpose in mind. What, what is the purpose of, of, of being literate? What is, what is it good for? Um, and I think it should, it should include the ability to, to make decisions, to participate in, a, in political life, of course, and not just to sign one name or not just to code. If you're a great coder, it doesn't mean that you are data literate. It takes more than that uh, to be literate in the, in the age of data. Um, so it's, it's really, for me, about being literate in the age of data and what we should try for, what we should promote through different programs and different actions is to give people uh, a greater incentive, a, a greater desire, an ability to, to be citizens in the age of data. So to, to, to use data, to question data, to argue about and through data. This is, for me, what a, a literate society is and will be in, in the age of data. And lastly, um, I don't really like the term data revolution because it focuses a lot on, on, on data, or revolution of the data. Uh, so I prefer uh, to think about a, a revolution via data or a radical evolution uh, via data, through and, and about data. So to end, I will just play this very short video. It's a minute and a half. Uh, that we w that we produced uh, about what is data literacy, um, and this will be the the end uh, of my presentation. And hopefully, this will sort of like summarize uh, what I've been trying to convey in the past uh, 30 minutes. Thank you. So we play the video. Is the, is the video playing?
Thank you. Again, thank you much, Raju. Agradecer al señor Letusé y ustedes pueden seguirlo a través de su cuenta en Twitter, arroba data 4 deb arroba data 4 deb allí lo pueden seguir. Vamos a continuar con la presentación y hablando más sobre la importancia del, del científico de datos en las organizaciones. Queremos invitar al señor Juan Carlos Puentes con su charla, científico de datos, la profesión más sexy del siglo XXI. 